by Karen Hess. Winter, 1935. State tests again. Miss Freeland said our grade topped the entire state of Oklahoma on the state test again, 24 points higher than the state average. Wish I could run home and tell Ma and see her nod and hear her say, I knew you could. It would be enough. January 1935 Christmas dinner without the cranberry sauce. Miss Freeland was my ma at the school Christmas dinner. I thought I'd be the only one without a real ma, but two other motherless girls came. We served turkey, chestnut dressing, sweet potatoes, and brown gravy. Made it all ourselves, and it came out pretty good. Better than the Christmas dinner I made for my father at home, where we sat at the table, silent, just the two of us. Being there without Ma, without the baby, wouldn't have been so bad if I'd just remembered the cranberry sauce. My father loved Ma's special cranberry sauce, but she never showed me how to make it. January 1935 Driving the cows, dust piles up like snow across the prairie. Dunes leaning against fences, mountains of dust pushing over barns. Joe De La Flor can't afford to feed his cows, can't afford to sell them. County Agent Dewey comes, takes the cows behind the barn, and shoots them. Too hard to catch their lungs, too hard to watch their lungs clog with dust, like our chickens suffocated. Better to let the government take them than suffer the sight of their bony hides sinking down into the earth. Joe De La Flor rides the range. Come spring, he'll, ra he'll gather Russian thistle, pulling the plant while it's still green and young before the prickles form, before it breaks free to tumble across the plains. He gathers thistle to feed what's left of his cattle, his bone-thin cattle. Cattle he drives away from the dried-up Beaver River to where the Cimarron ru still runs, pushing the herd across the breaks where they might last another week, maybe two, until it rains. January 1935. First rain. Sunday night. I stretch my legs in my iron bed under the roof. I place a wet cloth over my nose to keep from breathing dust and wipe the grime, the grime tracings from around my, my mouth and shiver, thinking of Ma. I am kept company by the sound of my heart, drumming, restless. I tangle in the dusty sheets, sending the sand flying, cursing the grit against my skin, between my teeth, under my lids, swearing I'll leave this forsaken place. I hear the first drops, like the tapping of a stranger at the door of a dream. The rain, the rain changes everything. It strokes the roof, streaking the dusty tin, ponging. A concert of rain notes, spilling from gutters, gushing through gullies, soaking into the thirsty earth outside. Morning, morning, Monday morning dawn, cloaked in mist. I button into my dress, slip on my sweater, and push my way off the porch, sticking my face into the fog, into the moist skin of the fog. The sound of dripping surrounds me as I walk to town. Soaked to my underwear, I can't bear to go through the schoolhouse door. I want only to stand in the rain. Monday afternoon, Joe De La Fleur brushes mud from his horse. Mr. King Cannon hires my father to pull his owns out of the muck on Route 64. And later, when the clouds lift, the farmers surveying their fields, Nod their heads as the frail stalks revive, everyone everything grateful for this moment, free of the weight of dust. January 1935 Hayden P. Nye Hayden P. Nye died this week. I knew him to wave. He liked the way I played piano. The newspaper said when Hayden first came, he could see only grass, grass and wild horses and wolves roaming. Then folks moved in and sod got busted and bushels of wheat turned the plains to gold and Hayden P. Nye grabbed the Oklahoma panhandle in his fist and held on. By the time the railroad came in, on land, Hayden sold them. The buffalo and the wild horses had gone. Some years, Hayden Nye saw the sun dry up his crop, saw the grasshoppers chew it down, but then came years of rain and the wheat thrived and his pockets filled and his big laugh came easy. They buried Hayden Nye on his land, busted more sod to lay down his bones. Will they sow wheat on his grave where the buffalo once grazed? January 1935. Scrubbing up dust. Walking past the Crystal Hotel, I saw Jim Martin down on his knees. 
He was scraping up mud that had dried to crust after the rain mixed with dust last Sunday last. When I got home, I took a good look at the steps and the porch and the windows. I saw them with Ma's eyes and thought about how she'd been haunting me. I thought about Ma, who would have washed clothes, beaten furniture, aired rugs, scrubbed floors, down on her knees, brushed in hand, breaking that mud like the farmer's break sod, always watching over her shoulder for the next duster to roll in. My stubborn Ma. She'd be doing it all with my brother Franklin to tend to. She never could stand a mess. My father doesn't notice the dried mud. At least, he never tells me. Not that he tells me much of anything these days. With Ma gone... With Ma gone, if the mud's to be busted, the job falls to me. It isn't the work I hate, the knuckle-breaking work of beating mud out of every blessed thing. But every day, my fingers and hands ache so bad, I think. I should just let them rest. But let the dust rest. Let the world rest. But I can't leave it rest. On account of Ma. Haunting. January 1935 Outlined by Dust my father stares at me while I sit across from him at the table, while I wash dishes in the basin, my back to him. The picked and fester bits of my hands in agony. He stares at me as I empty the wash water at the roots of Ma's apple trees. He spends long days digging for the electric train folks when they can use them. He spends long days digging for the electric train folks when they can use him. Or working here, nursing along the wheat, what there is of it, or digging the pond. He sings sometimes under his breath, even now, even after so much sorrow. He sings a man's song, deep with what has happened to us. It doesn't swing lightly the way Ma's voice did, the way Miss Freeland's voice does. The way Mad Dog sings, my father's voice starts and stops, like a short, like a car short of gas, like an engine choked with dust. And then he clears his throat and the song starts up again. He rubs his eyes the way I do, with his palms out, Ma never did that, and he wipes the milk from his upper lip same as me with his thumb and forefinger, Ma never did that either. We don't talk much, my father never was a talker. Ma's dying hasn't changed that, I guess he gets the sound out of him with the song he sings. I can't help thinking how it is for him without Ma waking up alone only, his shape left in the bed, outlined by dust. He always smelled a little like her first thing in the morning when he left her in bed and went out to do the milking. She'd scuff into the kitchen a few minutes later, bleary-eyed, to start breakfast. I don't think she was ever really meant for farm life. I think once she had bigger dreams, but she made herself over to fit my father. Now he smells of dust and coffee, tobacco and cows. None of the musky women smell left that was ma. He stares at me. Maybe he is looking for Ma. He won't find her. I look like him. I stand like him. I walk across the kitchen floor with that long-legged walk of his. I can't make myself over the way Ma did. And yet, if I could look in the mirror and see her in my face, if I could somehow know that Ma and baby Franklin lived on in me, but it can't be. It's my father. I'm my father's daughter. January 1935. The President's Ball. All across the land, couples dancing, arm in arm, hand in hand, at the birthday ball. My father puts on his best overalls. I wear my Sunday dress, the one with the white collar, and we walk to town to the Legion Hall and join the dance, our feet flying, me and my father on the wooden floor whirling to Arley Wanderdale and the Black Mesa Boys, till ten, when Arley stands up from the piano to announce we raised $33 for infantile paralysis, a little better than last year. And I remember last year when Mom was alive and we were crazy excited about the baby coming. And I played at the same party for Franklin D. Roosevelt and Joyce City and Arlie. Tonight for a little while and the Bright Hall folks were almost free, almost free of dust, almost free of debt, almost free of fields of withered wheat. Most of the night I think I smiled and twice my father laughed. Imagine. January 1935. Lunch. No one's going hungry at, at school today. The government sent canned meat, rice, potatoes. The bakery sent loaves of bread, and Scotty Moore, George Nall, and Willie Harkins brought in milk, fresh creamy milk, straight from their farms. Real lunch, and then stomachs full, 